All right, so here's your biology fun fact of the day. Okay, a single rotting apple can contain 90,000 roundworms. Okay, 90,000, that's a lot. Um, now granted, they are small. Okay, it's little bitty little worm, but they can be up to 90,000 of them in there. Um, that's not gonna be like the apple that's rotting on your counter. Okay, that's gonna be like an apple that falls from the tree and then the worms crawl up from the dirt into the, into the apple, okay? But they can contain lots of, lots of roundworms. All right, so last time we started talking about flatworms, okay? And so we, we talked about flatworms and we said that they have the three cell layers, they have bilateral symmetry, they have the gastrovascular cavity, um, and then we talked about uh, how, like the different kinds of parasitic roundworms, or sorry, flatworms, um, and today we're going to talk about roundworms and annelids. Okay, so roundworms are in phylum Nematoda. Okay, so these are called nematode worms, and they ha also have bilateral symmetry. Okay, oh, yeah, they have bilateral symmetry. They also have three cell layers. Okay, um, the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm, okay, just like the flatworm. But something that roundworms have that flatworms do not have is this thing that's called a pseudocelum. Okay? And a pseudocelum is basically a fluid-filled space between the mesoderm and the internal organ. So if you look at the picture, okay, the ectoderm is the outermost layer. Okay? The mesoderm is, would be here. Okay? And then the purple right here, that's the endoderm. A pseudocelum is this See this light blue line? This represents the pseudocelum. This would be full of fluid okay, in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. Okay, so it's a fluid-filled cavity in between the internal organs and the um, the mesoderm. So basically, what happens is this: egg and sperm fertilize the egg. Okay, that little egg then starts to grow and divide and becomes like a little embryo. Okay, in that embryo, you have three cell layers: the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm. Okay. The ectoderm develops and becomes the skin. The mesoderm develops and becomes like the muscles of the animal. And then the endoderm develops into the internal organs. Okay. So in things like roundworms, um, in between these internal organs and the muscle of their body wall, they've got a fluid-filled space. Does that make sense? So there's a space in between their mesoderm, their muscles of the body wall, and their internal organs, like their digestive tract. Does that make sense? Okay. And um, so they have a pseudocelum, which is not quite a full, like, true coelom. And annelids actually have a true coelom, and we'll talk about what the difference is between the two. Um, and then we'll talk about why it's so important that you have a fluid-filled space in between your body wall and your internal organs. But roundworms are the first ones that we've seen that have a pseudocelum or any sort of fluid-filled space between the mesoderm and the endoderm. This is also the first phylum that we've seen that um, the animals have a complete digestive tract. Okay, so one-way digestive tract. Um, and if you look on, so go to the first page of your notes, the very bottom, okay, number two, it says um, one-way digestive system. That should be two-way digestive system. Sorry, I made a mistake on the slide. So it should be a two-way digestive system in the bottom at number two, okay? So where it says flatworms, number two at the bottom, two-way oh. digestive tract, okay? But roundworms have a complete one-way digestive tract. That means food comes in one way and it travels through one way and then exits out the other end, okay? Whereas in all of the other animals that we've seen, like, Nidarians, okay, food comes in one way, gets digested, and then waste passes out the same way, right? So waste, stuff goes in two ways in the same opening. Here, um, one way, right? So you can eat something and it can be traveling through your digestive system, um, and then you can eat something else because it'll pass through and go out the other way, and you don't have to worry about blocking and um, blocking your mouth where the waste products would come out, okay? So, uh, they do have a complete one-way digestive tract. Roundworms can be microscopic, so teeny, teeny, tiny, up to one meter long. So 3.3 feet is a meter, so you can have roundworms that are like this big. It's crazy. They're huge. Oh. 
bones grow. They're they're not going to be super fat, but they're gonna they're gonna be super long. Okay. Um, and roundworms can exist pretty much everywhere. Most of them are found in the soil, but you also find some uh, in the ocean and particularly um, between the grains of sand, like on sandy shores and beaches and stuff. So they uh, they do are found pretty much everywhere in the world. Most of them are free living, meaning they're traveling around, moving around, finding their own food. But you do have some kinds that are parasitic. Um, and we'll talk about some of the parasitic kinds today because they can actually cause some pretty horrific diseases in humans. Um, so we'll talk about, we'll talk about a few. Um, and they can be parasites and stuff in like whales and stuff like that too. Okay. Um, we're not gonna actually look at any of the classes of roundworms. We're just simply gonna use Ascaris, which is actually a um, parasitic roundworm as our model nematode. All right, so let's look at how nematode worms actually carry out the seven essential functions. Okay, so how do they digest food? Well, they have a complete one-way digestive system. So food enters in the mouth, travels through like the pharynx into the stomach, where it's broken down into the gut, or sorry, the intestine where it gets absorbed, and then any waste products pass out the other end through the anus. Okay, so one-way digestive tract. This is definitely not a gastrovascular cavity, right? It's a complete digestive system at this point. And you can see here. And on here, you can also see the pseudocelum, right? So here's the gut, right? And then here's the body wall up here. And there's all everywhere that's in green on that picture, that's the pseudocelum. So that's the fluid-filled space. Okay, so it's full of fluid. All right. Okay, the respiratory and circulatory system, they don't have them, okay? Um, they don't have an organized system for respiration to get oxygen, and they do not have an organized system for circulation, for circulation either. Um, they can still simply rely on diffusion. Okay, so oxygen will diffuse through their ectoderm um, in, and carbon dioxide will diffuse out. And they are small enough, thin enough that they can rely on diffusion and they don't need a circulatory system to transport anything around. Okay. They can get big, but they're still thin enough, the cells are, and they're still thin enough that they can rely on diffusion. Um, a lot of the worms, especially the parasitic worms, have this thing called a cuticle on the outside of their body. And that cuticle is actually like this hard, tough protein outer covering. Um, and it helps for those worms to be able to survive in some pretty harsh environments. Um, it, it protects them. And just to give you an idea of like how much it can actually protect them, there's some kinds of worms, parasitic roundworms, that you could take them and stick them in straight vinegar and they could survive because of this cuticle. Um, so they can live in pretty acidic environments. Um, so it would be hard to kill, right? So that cuticle um, protects them and covers their outer, outer layer. And the cuticle is tough, and they actually have to um, like kind of molt that cuticle in order to grow. So they'll have to like get rid of the cuticle, grow, and then grow a new cuticle. So hard outer covering to help to protect them. Some of the parasitic flatworms have it as well. Um, their excretory system. So they've got uh, excretory canals with two pores that they will use to get rid of any sort of waste product, and that is up near their anterior end. Any sort of like ammonia and stuff that they would produce naturally by doing the natural things that cells do can diffuse out of their ectoderm through their skin. Um, and then any sort of like water balance that they need to maintain will be maintained with these excretory pores. Okay, so they'll if they have excess water that's getting in their body, they'll filter it out and get rid of it through these excretory pores. Okay, um, so here's the excretory pore up here, right? So, and then these are the excretory canals. Um, and so they'll filter their body fluid. So see the pseudocelin that's filled with fluid? They'll actually filter that body fluid and then any excess waste comes out through the excretory pores. All right? Um, their nervous system. So they do have a head and they do have a brain and they have a dorsal and a ventral nerve cord. Um, do you remember what dorsal means? Yeah, like the top, like the back. What's ventral? 
bottom, right, or the belly. So their brain is actually circular, and it's a circle around their pharynx, okay? Um, and then they've got a dorsal nerve cord that runs down their back, and then they've got a ventral one that runs down their belly, okay? Um, they don't really have eyes okay, or anything like that, um, particularly like the parasitic ones, they don't need it. But um, they do have a dorsal nerve cord and a brain, and they will use those to respond to their environment. Their musculoskeletal system, they only have longitudinal muscles, so that means that the muscles run from like the mouth down the body towards the tail. So the muscles extend this way. When a muscle contracts, what happens to it? They get shorter, right? So if you take your worm and the muscles are running this way, when those muscles contract, they get shorter, right? And then if they extend those muscles, they get longer again. Contract, get shorter, right? And so as they contract and extend these muscles, they move, okay? So they're swimming around. Yeah, so they kind of like, they their, their normal size, they contract and pull their tail up, right? And then extend and push their head forward, contract and pull their tail up, <laughs> and <laughs> go forward. Okay, reproductive system. Um, they do sexual reproduction, so only. They don't do asexual reproduction. And they do have male and female. So there will be male worms and female worms. The females are typically larger than the males because it takes more energy and it's harder to produce eggs and so they need to be larger in order to be able to store those eggs and um, save up enough energy to make them. Um, and then they will actually copulate. So the male has a copulatory spicule that he will use to pass the sperm to the female. She'll take it and put, fertilize her eggs and then release her eggs. Okay, and the new generation of uh, roundworms is born. All right, so. They do sexual reproduction. Okay, so the free-living flatworms and roundworms, they're very ecologically important, but um, some of the parasitic ones are kind of fun to talk about because they cause some pretty crazy things. Um, but one of the main things that particularly nematode worms are going to do are they're going to be um, an important step in the food chain. So we actually have these things that are called myofaunal nematodes. Okay, so if you think of like a grain of sand, okay, um, if you take two grains of sand and think of them like next to each other, there are little round worms that live in between the grains of sand. Okay, so our little worm would live right in between those two grains of sand. Uh, anything that lives between the grains of sand is called myofaunal. Okay, and so you have these little myofaunal nematode worms live between the grains of sand, go around eating like detritus and stuff like that. And then there are other kinds of things like crabs that will go through and actually eat the dirt, okay, eat the sand on the shore, and they'll digest the roundworms and then poop out the sand. So they actually help to like take all of the food uh, and energy that's available in the detritus and pass it up the food chain. So they are important in the food chain. So let's talk about some of the parasites and what they could actually do to you because kind of interesting. So we talked about flatworm parasites last time, right? The flukes and the tapeworm, okay? Um, roundworm parasites, there's a lot, okay? A lot of them. Ascaris is like a fluke or a tapeworm, okay? So it gets into your intestines and it attaches and so soaks up nutrients and stuff from your intestines. It's um, a little bit gross because it can actually move through your body. So like when it's ready, <laughs> when it's ready to, um, to, as in its larval stage, it can actually like move around and it'll go up into your lungs and spend part of its time in your lungs. And then, no, and then um, it'll actually, when it's ready to reproduce, crawl up your, your trachea to the back of your throat where you will swallow it again. And it will, no, it's small. You'll swallow it again and it'll go back into your intestines and then um, reproduce and then you poop out the fertilized egg. Yeah, lovely, pleasant, right? Mm -mm. Um, and it can cause all sorts of problems because the females will look for the males and they don't have eyes or anything like that, so they kind of do it by touch. And apparently your bile duct that empties your bile into your intestines apparently feels like a male to them. So a lot of times they actually congregate right there and they end up blocking your bile ducts and can cause all sorts of problems for you. So, gross. <laughs> That's the scariest. Um, Hookworm is a little bit more sinister than just a normal like worm. They um, actually 
they live in your intestines, but they actually burrow through your intestinal wall and feed on your blood supply. So they'll actually like make little sores in your intestinal wall. And you have lots of bacteria that live in your intestines. And so they can actually cause you to get like these infections, big infections in your intestine um, from this worm because they're opening up your intestinal wall. Um, filarial worms cause elephantitis. Do you know what elephantitis is? Okay, um, elephantitis is like you swell up really big. So here, let me find a picture for you. Yeah, well, I'm going to... Yeah, um, yeah, because it happens there quite a bit, actually. So here's what happens in elephantitis, okay? Uh, so you know how, um, how, how many of you have ever been on like a plane for a long period of time because you're flying somewhere and then your ankles swell? Yeah. Okay, basically what happens is when you sit for a long time, um, your, your blood has fluid in it, right? Um, and in the capillaries, the, the capillaries are not very like close together. Okay, so capillaries are actually like they have little holes in it not big enough for the red blood cells to go through, but big enough for like the fluid that's in your blood to go through. So as you sit there, um, some of the fluid leaks from your blood vessels into the surrounding tissue. And one of the things that kind of like helps to get that fluid back up to your heart to be dumped back into the blood is movement of your muscles. So when you sit there for a long period of time and you don't move, that fluid accumulates, okay? What happens is uh, that fluid can get put back into lymph vessels and then those lymph vessels go back up to your heart and it gets dumped back all well, that fluid gets dumped back into your into your um, blood stream these worms block those lymph vessels okay so they get into the lymph vessels and they block the lymph vessels so that fluid can't ever make it back up to get dumped back into your to your bloodstream and so it accumulates in your um, appendages and does stuff like that okay so it causes you to swell up really big and yeah, it's not pleasant. What? It's not blisters. These are actually, this is like um, like folds of skin that are just full of like, it's, it's not going to be super squishy. Um, it's going to be more like um, actually pretty firm, right? Because the it's fluid, but it's like all in, in your tissues. And so you've got like all of your protein fibers and the actual cells of your... Like Anti-parasitic drugs. No, no, it wouldn't just strain out. No. So, because it's it's all the fluid is in between the cells of your of your body. Yeah, it would just bleed. Yeah, it would be bad. Anyways, so filarial worms will cause that. Um, guinea worms. We're gonna skip trichinella. Guinea worms actually like. They get in by like a bite from a fly or a mosquito. And so they'll get in and then when they're ready to reproduce, they actually come to the surface of your skin and form like blister boil things on your skin. You see a worm and yeah, it's gross. Um, yeah, you can see the, the little worm. Eye worms are just what they sound like. They're worms that actually get into your eye. Um, yeah, and you can, yeah, you can see them like in your eye and you can actually see them like going across. There's stories of like ones moving from one eye across the bridge of the nose to like the other eye. So, it's, well, they you have to get it surgically. It's like in the actual eye, so it's not just like on. Yeah, it's like in your eye. Yeah. If you don't want to see, then look away. They would be parasites on different kinds of mammals. Uh, I were. Okay, I'm trying to find them. Okay, if you don't want to see this, look away now. Okay, so there's the worm. Okay, that's a really nasty looking worm. Yeah, well, you can see it like in there or like here. They just move around in your eyeball, yeah. It's pretty gross. 
You would have to get it removed, yeah. So the doctor would come in and actually kind of slice that open and then pull out that worm. So, but I mean, the good news is they tend to not cause blindness, so that's good. <laughs> tend to, yeah. So, anyways, those are the parasites, parasitic roundworms. Okay, annelids, phylum annelida. Um, annelids get their name, their phylum name, from the Latin word annelus, which means little ring. And so annelids are, um, think of like an earthworm. An earthworm is an annelid. And if you think of an earthworm, it's got like all the like little like grooves on it, right? Those are the little rings that they get their, their name from. Um, so it means little ring. They are segmented worms. So those little bumps that you see on the surface, okay, that's actually um, a physical like segment in the worm. Um, and they actually have tissue that will separate internally all of those parts of their body. Yes? Uh, okay, they also have bilateral symmetry. They also have three cell layers. Earthworms, though, have a true coelom. Okay, and so they have a true fluid-filled cavity between the, the mesoderm and their internal organs. So here's the comparison between um, a nematode worm and an annelid. Okay, a true. So in order to have a true coelom, okay, the fluid-filled cavity has to be completely surrounded by the mesoderm. Okay, if it's completely surrounded by the mesoderm, then it's considered to be a true coelom. Okay, so and your nematode worm over here. Okay, you have your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and your endoderm, and then you've got your pseudo coelom. Okay, in between. Do you see that? In a coelom, okay. The mesoderm completely surrounds that, uh, that fluid-filled space. So this is all the mesoderm right here, okay? And so, and here's part of your coelom over here. The mesoderm surrounds it completely, okay? So that's considered to be a true coelom. Um, whereas a pseudo coelom, it's like pseudo, like fake, right? A fake coelom, um, where or the mesoderm only surrounds it on one side. Do you see that? So annelids have a true coelom. So here, let's look at this. So this is a comparison of the three worms, worm types, so you can actually see what it looks like, okay? So flatworms up here, okay, they have the three cell layers, but no pseudocelum or coelom, okay? So you've got the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, and the gastrovascular cavity inside. So those are their three cell layers. And a nematode worm, okay, the blue is ectoderm, the mesoderm's red, you've got your pseudocelum, your fluid-filled space, and then you've got your endoderm and your, and your digestive tract in here. Do you see that? Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and then down here, this is an annelid, okay, this is a true coelom. Okay, so you have your ectoderm on the outside, endoderm in here, here's your fluid-filled space, and can you see the red, how it completely surrounds? that fluid filled space. So that's a true coelom. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, you have your three cell layers, endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. Okay, the ectoderm develops into the epidermis or the skin. The mesoderm is going to develop into like the muscles. And then your endoderm is going to develop into your digestive system and other internal organs. Okay, so what? mesentery is going to be things like um, that surround organs and kind of hold things in place, really. Okay. So why do we have to talk about a coelom? <laughs> Here's why. Uh, the coelom actually is important for animals, and you have a coelom as well, actually. Um, so what it does is it actually provides separation um, from the internal organs and the body wall. Okay? And when it does that, it actually allows for your internal organs or your body wall to move independently of each other. Okay, so if you had breakfast this morning, your stomach 
is in your belly, right? And you've got your coelom, so it's like a fluid-filled space in between your stomach and your actual like abs, right? And so if you ate this morning, your stomach is like moving around and mixing up all of that food and di working on digesting your breakfast. But if you look at your stomach right now, you're not going to see that, are you? Okay, that's because there's a separation. So you've got your, your actual abs, your body wall, and then your stomach behind there, and your stomach's moving behind there to digest your food. If, there was a, if they were not separated, any time your stomach moved, your abs would move. Okay, so you'd like watch and people, you could see like their stomach moving as they're digesting their food. That would be weird. Okay, so it allows for independent movement behind um, the body wall. Okay, and it also provides some protection for those internal organs as well. Okay, so it allows for independent movement. It also allows for a spot for a true circulatory system to develop. Okay, so the true circulatory system can be formed inside of that coelom. Um, and that as that coelomic fluid kind of moves around, okay, uh, it can help to deliver oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide. And then it can also help to deliver nutrients and um, pick up waste products. Okay, so that's why it's important, right? And so you've got all you've got your coelom, right, which is in your belly, and then you've also got another cavity which contains like your lungs and your heart and stuff like that. Okay, it allows for independent movement. Okay, so classes of annelids. Um, the class of annelids that we're most likely to find in the ocean is class Polychaeta, so polychaete worms. These are bristly marine worms. So on each segment, they have these two little extensions, one on either side of their body that are called pseudopods. Oh, not pseudopods, sorry, parapodia. Um, and those little parapodia have attached to them like these bristles. So think of like wiry, strong hairs. Okay, so they've got these bristles that are attached to them. Um, and they'll use those to like swim or move around. Okay. Um, and so this picture right here in the upper right, that's, this is a sea mouse, okay? This is a marine polychaete worm, okay? So they, polychaete worms are going to be serving a lot of different functions in the ocean. Um, they can be predators, so some of them will actually have like jaws and they'll move around and, and hunt for prey. Um, some of them are filter feeders, okay, or well actually technically suspension feeders. So remember um, these pictures, okay? This picture right here and this upper right picture, those are marine polychaete worms. Okay, so those what you're seeing there, those are actually just their gills. Okay, and the rest of the actual worm's body is below the surface. So they are they are worms. Okay, and so they are going to be suspension feeders, right? Feeding on things like phytoplankton and zooplankton and detritus that are in the water. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So those are polychaete worms. Um, oligochaete worms, those are earthworms, those are terrestrial. You'll find them on land. Hopefully you're fairly familiar with what an earthworm looks like. Okay, there's your little earthworm. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, here are Dunia. These are leeches. Okay, so leeches are mostly freshwater, but we actually do have a saltwater marine leech. Um, and they are annelid worms that have suckers at both ends of their body. Um, one of those suckers will contain their mouth, okay, and in their mouth they've got like three teeth that they will use to bite on to you, okay, or to their prey, um, and they'll cut through the skin, and they secrete an, a, like an anti anticoagulant and also an antiseptic, okay. So the anesthetic makes it so you don't feel it when they bite, Right? It's like a numbing thing. Um, and then the anticoagulant means that your blood won't clot. So they can just kind of sit there and suck your blood and it won't clot. Okay? Um, and so they are parasites. There is a marine leech. Um, they did used to be used for like medical purposes. And actually they still are in some cases. So they actually can be helpful in some cases medically. Um, but they used to think that like your like the health of your body depended on four humors. So the phlegm, the blood, black bile, and yellow bile. And as long as all of those humors were in balance, you were healthy. And so if you were not, if you were sick, 
then clearly it was because one of those humors was out of balance. So they'd use leeches to like suck out your blood because they think that your blood was, you had too much blood basically. So that's why you're sick. Um, so they would use leeches to bleed people. And that's also why they would cut like people's arms and bleed. Yeah. Nowadays we use it because in certain certain kinds of like swelling and stuff like that, they're actually helpful to get rid of some of the the trapped blood. So yeah, they can be helpful. And they are parasites on some kinds of fish and stuff like that. All right, form and function in annelids. Um, so how do they do all of their their life processes? We're going to use earthworms as our model marine annelid, um, mostly because uh, that's probably what you're most familiar with, right? So you know something about marine worms or uh, earthworms. Okay, so let's look at their digestive system, how they digest food. They have a complete digestive system, mouth to anus. Um, food enters into the mouth through the pharynx, through the esophagus, where it ends up in the crop. Okay, the crop is a holding tank, basically. Okay, so it holds foods there, holds food there. Um, and then when the gizzard is ready for it, the crop will send the food to the gizzard. The gizzard is a grinding organ. Okay, so it takes all that food and it grinds it up and helps to digest it. Okay, then it gets sent to the intestine where all of those nutrients are absorbed, and then any waste products exit out the anus. Okay, so it's got a complete one-way digestive system. No, the thick band will be um, elsewhere. Yes, earthworms eat dirt. Yes, and some of some marine annelids will as well. Yeah, kind of like eat their way through. Yes. Okay, their respiratory system. So if they are aquatic, aka marine annelids, they will have gills in order to capture oxygen. So they will have gills. Um, and so those things that we were looking at, those worms at the very, very beginning, they look, that look all pretty, those are actually the gills of the animal. Okay, so they stick their gills out in order to feed. Um, but like earthworms actually will do respiration through their skin. Okay, so they don't have like gills or lungs or anything like that. Their skin remains wet, moist, and they will be able to exchange oxygen through their skin. And that's all they need. So that they don't have a full respiratory system. So here's the picture. Um, and so you can see, okay, so see like the little segments here? Okay, and notice that at those like little indentations, that's actually where tissue comes through the worm and separates it into different segments. Okay, and so in each of these segments, they're going to have like um, some of the same organs. So like they're going to have like two kidneys in each of those. All right, and stuff like that. So that's what they look like. The circulatory system, they actually have a closed circulatory system. Um, so that means that their blood is always contained in blood vessels like yours. Okay, so blood is always in blood vessels and then gets pumped by hearts around the body. Um, earthworms actually have five hearts to pump the blood. And so you can see on this picture, okay, the red. That's their, their blood vessels, and then their hearts are located up here. They've got like five accessory hearts and then one main heart. Um, and they're just essentially blood vessels that can squeeze, okay, and help to push the blood around. Okay, and the blood circulates through and delivers oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide. If it's a marine worm, then that blood's going to go to the gills to get rid of the carbon dioxide and get oxygen. Um, if it's an earthworm, it's going to diffuse through the skin. They can have like eye spots, yeah. So they can have eye spots. They can also have like statosis in order to tell up from down, okay. They will also, a lot of marine annelids will have sensory tentacles. So they're like, like protrusions by the sides of their mouth that have like chemical receptors on there to help them to find prey. Um, so they'll have like tentacles around their mouth and chemical receptors to help to find food. Um, they do have a brain, and then they also have a ventral nerve cord that runs down their belly. Okay? Oh, sorry, I forgot to scroll down. Here it is. 
Um, so the excretory system. So they actually have what are called nephridia, basically kidneys in each of their segments. Um, and I'm going to go back so you can actually see that. So this green thing, that would be their nephridia, their kidney. Okay. And so this little tubule is going to filter um, any waste product out of that fluid that's in the coelom. Okay. And then they've got little pores okay, on their segments of their body that they'll use to get rid of that, those waste products. So that's them essentially peeing okay, to get rid of waste products. So they have kidneys in each section. Sorry about that. Okay. You got the nervous system too? Okay. Okay, how they move. They have longitudinal and circular muscles. So that means that longitudinal, it runs the length of their body. Okay. Um, and circular means it wraps around their body. Okay. So what they do is they actually alternate um, squeezing the, each set of muscles. Okay. So when they, so if this is my worm, Okay, the circular muscles wrap around it. When they contract those circular muscles, it elongates the body of the worm. Okay, so it pushes it out this way, right? So it kind of squeezes it like that. Okay, um, and so it elongates them. When they relax those and they contract their longitudinal muscles, it's going to pull the worm this way, right? And so they're going to alternate, like elongating with their circular muscles and then shortening themselves with their longitudinal. Elongating with their circular, shortening themselves with their longitudinal. Okay, and they've got these little things called setae, like little bristle hairs that they'll use to like grip onto the surface and pull themselves forward. All right, does that make sense? Okay, good, we'll finish this next time. <laughs>